Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for Experiences in a New World, Lessons Learned from Organizing Online Conferences. My name is Verletta Kern, and I'm the Digital Scholarship Librarian here at the UW Libraries. My role is a concierge role designed to help you use digital tools to explore and share your research in new ways. Today's session is part of our Hacking the Academy series designed to take a cross-disciplinary look at the new ways in which scholarship is produced, archived, evaluated, reused, and shared with wider publics. And so if you like today's program, I'd encourage you to follow our website for additional programming there. I'm gonna get started with a couple of housekeeping items before we jump into our fantastic program for today. As you can see, we're recording today's session and we'll share the recording link with you once it's available. Closed captioning of this event is available by clicking on the CC button in Zoom. And we'll begin the program with short talks from each of our panelists. They'll describe their work flipping events traditionally held in person to an online format. And then following our short talks, we'll open the floor up to your questions. As we engage together online, we'll encourage you to abide by the library's code of conduct. You can share any comments or responses you have um, with our panelists using the chat feature in Zoom. And we'll ask that you submit any questions you have per, for our presenters by clicking on the Q&A feature in Zoom. So at this point, without further ado, I'm gonna turn the virtual mic over to my colleague, Elliot Stevens, who's gonna introduce our panelists today. Great. Thank you so much, Verletta. Um, so we have a, a great list of people today. First, we're going to hear from um, Christine uh, Sugatan, the program administrator for the Center for Teaching and Learning, as well as Wei Zhou, who is an instructional consultant at the Center for Teacher and Learning. Um, and they're going to be talking to us about an online teaching and learning symposium. After Christine and Wei, we're going to hear from Charles Laporte, professor in the English department. Department, and he's going to be speaking about the ecology and religion in the 19th century studies conference, um, which was also held online. After Charles, we're going to hear from Madeline Munt, head of the Research Commons, who is going to be speaking about the Going Public conference, which was something that very quickly had to be turned in, from an in person conference into an online conference because of the, the pandemic. And then finally, we're going to hear from Matt Poland, a doctoral candidate in the English department who's going to be speaking about V21, Victorian Studies for the 21st Century. Um, it's an, uh, uh, seminars for the V21 group um, that were held online. Um, so uh, Christine and Wei, if you'd like to, to get things started for us, that'd be wonderful. Thank you for the introduction. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. So we're going to get started to introduce CTL Center for Teaching and Learning 16th Annual Symposium, which is online this year. So typically, the symposium, we had it in person, and we have 70 to 75 posters. The poster will be presented either by individual or by the team. And usually, there are 200 to 250. 50 people attended. Um, usually when it's in person, it takes place in the hub, the second floor, the ballroom, so that people can see the posters and come and go and chat with presenters. And in between two poster sessions, we typically have a keynote speaking session for everybody come together to listen. So um, this is how the format used to go in person. And this year, the 16th annual symposium for CTL, the theme is equity in online teaching. Symposium, it's a tri-campus event. So not including only Seattle campus, but also Bothell and Tacoma's presenters and audience all come here. And posters are typically either based on their research or based on the teaching practice. So due to the scenario, we have to make very dramatic and quick changes. So this is what will look, what it looked like online. And I want to use the share screen so that you can see what's the online symposium this year look like. Okay. Um, I hope you can all see my screen right now. Yeah. Yes, we can see your screen. That's perfect. So as you can see, this um, April 6, 2 to 4.30, that's our event. And the keynote panel become online over Zoom 
a, synch a synchronous um, discussion about equity in online teaching. It was recorded so people can watch later. And how about the posters? So the number, odd number one, three, five, seven, all those odd number or poster session one, and then even number two, four, eight, six, eight, or the poster session two. So during the time of the event, we opened session by session and take this number 10, teaching climbing through fiction, data, and the lived experience, for example. Audience in real time, they could see the abstract, click a PDF version of the poster, and watch over YouTube of the pre-recorded. Yeah, so they watch um, in the real time. And then they use the software discourse to ask a question. So here you can see a little clips of when the symposium took place. People who watched the video on, on YouTube and then leave comments. And during the time 3.45 to 4.30, the presenters were alive and answered the questions back and forth synchronously. Yeah, so that was what it looked like in online. And this is a big transition for us and there are many lessons learned. And Christine, you can share about that part if you like. Great, thank you, Wei. Uh, some of the biggest questions that we had for our symposium, which is traditionally in person, were how do you move an in person event online while trying to maintain that engaging and conversational aspect that you have um, when you are together and maintaining that community? But also, how do you allow for flexibility since during when the pandemic started, it was a very quick transition? where we were all planning to have this in person and moving it online. I believe it was just a two-week turnaround where we were trying to get all of our materials together. And two, how do you, and three, sorry, how do you acknowledge the online symposium as an investment of a presenter's time and of their scholarly work? Um, with the change in the transition of teaching remotely, being part of our event is just an added, an add-on to that portfolio already. And so some of the lessons learned from this experience were communication. It was really key. Communicating with our presenters and our internal staff, providing clear and friendly instructions from how to create and upload poster presentations, where to upload it, where to go to for assistance that day, also ensuring that materials were available and accessible um, because everybody would be at their residence or some other location, um, ensuring that they would be able to log on and go to a presenter page, um, it was really important that they could see it, hear it, and read the abstract in a clear format that was consistent with each presenter. Um, also, we asked that each presenter ensure that their YouTube video included subtitles. So that for those who, have, have, who might have an impairment or anything of some sort, um, it's important to have subtitles, but also just for transparency and for accessibility all around, which is important to us at the CTL. A crucial lesson that we also learned was testing our application. Because we were sending out so much information with our transition and updating our presenters with next steps, we, on our end, had to ensure that what they were going to be doing would work for them. Um, because that is added time already, what we did on our staff was we tested a YouTube video, we uploaded that video so that they could use it as a template um, and see some of the possible formats that they could utilize. But also we tested the DISCUS application, which was a plugin that we added to our website so that you could see the real-time conversations that presenters would have with attendees. One of the things too that we learned was having a Zoom help room. Um, it just so happened that the initial Zoom link that we sent out to the community, um, that was for Zoom and we switched to a Zoom webinar which created a new Zoom link uh, in itself. And so we used that to our advantage, um, utilizing the original Zoom link as our Zoom room. And it was really nice to see people pop in asking, okay, I think your Zoom room changed. Where are you going to be? Where's your symposium? So it was really nice to be there to support presenters and to support attendees in case they had other questions or if they just um, needed to verify that this was the proper place they had to be. 
Um, so that was, I think, our biggest takeaways with our symposium. We were happy with being able to produce something that was successful, and we hope that um, we plan to use this as a template and as a guide in the future if we find that we will be hosting future programs and services in the online format in the future. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Wei. And then um, next we're hearing from Charles Laporte. And for all you attendees, as you as questions occur to you, feel free to put them in the Q&A or, or, or you can wait to hear everybody and then put them in the Q&A then. But um, the Q&A is where we will put all of our questions. You're on mute, Charles. Sorry. Sorry about that. I'm unused to the mute kicking on because usually I'm the sole host. Um, so I wanted to, to begin my portion with a confession, which is that when I agreed to be on this panel, I did not realize that the plan was to be discussing fully online conferencing. Um, indeed, in my own department, when it was sent out to the English department, it was advertised as totally online. Um, and I'm, I'm delighted to have this chance to learn from my um, colleagues here. But what I'd like to talk to you about is actually uh, partially online or fully online in some senses of the term. Um, and I've made a, a little PowerPoint uh, that I'm going to share with you. Yeah, so you see that my, my title is fully online is great, but mostly online is surely better. Um, that's based on the experience that I've had uh, here at the University of Washington, helping to organize a mostly online conference or a conference that we call the hybrid conference last September that was done in collaboration with a number of other universities elsewhere in the world. Our, our conference was uh, not done in any kind of, I, I totally sympathize with the, the uh, stress that Wayne, Christine, and Madeline are describing of like realizing that you have to go online uh, all of a sudden. I mean, that's just unbelievable. Um, our conference was very different because we were not responding to the pandemic last September, obviously. We were actually pursuing this mode of online conferencing for ecological reasons. We were uh, thinking about the amount that academics have to travel, the amount that we do travel, and uh, you know, looking at people in the private uh, world like Greta Thunberg and, and sort of rethinking the extent to which how much of, of the work that we do could be shared online. So I helped to develop this conference in collaboration with colleagues of mine at the University of Lancaster and at uh, Baylor University in Texas. And, and when I say I helped to, what I really mean is they did the lion's share of the work that the two uh, centers for the conference were in uh, Waco and Lancaster in the UK. And then the Seattle portion of the conference we refer to as one of the two satellites, the other one being Washington, D.C. So the four universities were UW, Baylor, Georgetown, and the University of Lancaster in the UK. And our idea was that we were having small local conferences and sharing uh, what we had with one another online so that there were sort of both viewing sessions and, and uh, in-person sessions as a way of, of uh, diminishing our conference travel, of diminishing our carbon footprint. Atlanta is also there, as you can see on the, on the PowerPoint, but they didn't actually present any material uh, that was at Emory University. They were simply interested in learning about online conferencing and, and what the possibilities were. So just so that you can see what it looks like, this was our UW Roundtable, uh, the congregation of scholars in the undergraduate library and the, the, uh, the room that's designed for broadcasts. Um, and what you have here is a combination of, of uh, UW scholars, UW graduate students, and nearby scholars so that uh, you can see me up here in the front. Here's Matt, who we'll be talking to later. Uh, Heidi Kaufman here, 
came up from uh, the University of Oregon for this conference, which is, you know, rel given how remote Seattle is, that's relatively local, right? Uh, Sarah Weger came up from the University of Portland, also in Oregon. Risha Dwar came down from Douglas College in UBC, uh, as well as we had people from across town. Joe McQueen, Chris Cheney, Misha Ouellette, they all came, they were universities in town, Seattle Pacific University and North, Northwest University in Kirkland. But it was a chance for us to sort of all come together, present material, but in conversation with, with people at these other remote sites, all of which were quite remote because, I mean, the, the distance between Seattle and Lancaster is 5,000 miles. But even, you know, it, it's a couple thousand miles to get you down to, to uh, Waco, Texas as well. And DC, obviously, that's a six hour flight, right? I mean, one of the things about being at UW is that you're pretty far away from just about everyone else, um, unless they're maybe in Vancouver. Here's the Georgetown panel. Again, it was people sort of coming from up and down the, the uh, Eastern Seaboard. Uh, the furthest, I guess, would be Daniel Williams in the middle from Bard College, but there's Meredith Martin from Princeton and Gary Viswanathan from Columbia. So they had a, it's obviously much easier for them. They all could take the train, but we took the train too. I mean, the, the people, no one took a, a flight to this conference. That was the point is that we were sort of locally congregating. Um, here's the Baylor session and you can see here we we used webex we didn't use zoom for this conference well we did use zoom we had to combine a number of things but webex was was the main uh vehicle for the conference but you can see here you've got you've got three presenters there in the middle and the screen for one of the presenters but you've also got an extra screen for for an external presenter so elizabeth howard is not there in waco texas presenting she's presenting remotely the other people are present uh, in the audience, and then the Q&A comes both remotely and, and uh, to the audience. Here's Emma Mason of Warwick University at Lancaster University. Uh, Lancaster, too, they, they had a sort of, uh, well, a similar setup to the one that was uh, at the uh, Armstrong Browning Library at Baylor University in Waco. That's what the audience looks like. And here you can see Emma Mason on the screen. She's also projected on the, the front screen. This was for the uh, keynote lecture. And you can tell by the fact that it's not just like a, a large number of miles that the, the really tricky feature of this conference you will have already figured out was actually about time zones, right? Because we're all in very different time zones. So this is an example of uh, what it looked like for us to figure out how to do, how to time things properly. We had one keynote panel in which uh, one representative from each of the four sites addressed the whole panel remotely, right, via the screen. So our representative was my colleague, Gary Handwerk, uh, and he presented on ecologies and economies of, of nature from uh, Malthus and thereafter. He's a, an eco-critic. Um, but then his paper was followed by Joshua King's paper from Texas, followed by Patrick O'Malley's paper from Georgetown, followed by uh, Emma Mason's paper from Warwick. And you can see that, that what, where we were congregating in the undergraduate library at 9.30 a.m., uh, out in Lancaster in the UK, they were congregating at 5.30 p.m., right? That, that uh, we were finishing just the keynote panel just before lunch, so it was fabulous for us but it was really in the middle of lunch for the Texas people, and it was just after lunch for the Georgetown people. Um, it, was, it was a challenging thing, and we were worried a lot about, you know, what if the, the tech, tech breaks down during this panel? Like, we got, we got multiple sites uh, connected all at once. We wanted it to be live. We recorded it. That's part of the beauty of online conferencing, just like this session has been recorded. So we had a chance to record it, but we also, uh, we wanted it to be live because we wanted Q&A and we wanted the, the sort of back and forth that you get from normal conferencing, right? Which at least in the humanities, I know in the sciences, there's a lot of posters and stuff, but in humanities, conferencing is, is about conversations, right? About, about having a chance to, to dialogue with people. Um, here's Gary Handwerk. He's my colleague who, who gave the, uh, the keynote lecture for us. Um, you can see that we did things like make little nameplates so that we'd be more visible. You can also see from this that it didn't especially work well 
Uh, nonetheless, it was it was a very successful uh, conference that uh, again uh, Josh King at Baylor crunched the numbers afterward, and uh, this is from a write up that he did in response to to a funding request that we had. He writes the impact was significant for our conference. Two hundred fifty people attended the various sites in person, and six hundred and one others participated and viewed digitally from one hundred sixty five cities in 19 nations. In other words, with each site devoting resources sufficient for a moderately sized academic or conference or symposium, we reached an audience of nearly 1,000 people combined. So that's pretty good. Like, that's, it's, it's a nice thing. Uh, yeah, oh, sorry, there's us again. And then I want to get to, I am realize I'm, I'm eating up my time slightly quicker than I, I wanted to, but I wanted to get to my my takeaway points, which strike me as uh, important. And, and takeaway point number one is, is really my argument for hybrid conferencing instead of all online conferencing, once we can get back to conferencing, obviously during a pandemic where we're, we're stuck. But the, the advantage of having sort of local gatherings as opposed to everyone online, uh, number one is huge. It can be stressful to count upon the tech working right, for that uh, keynote session, we had three different trial runs, uh, one of which failed utterly, which is why we kept doing it, just to make sure that it would work. Uh, you, you want it to work. At the same time, if you have a hybrid format, that reduces the stress considerably, because if the tech fails, you still have a symposium, right? You still get the conference experience that, that uh, you came for. I think that, that, that took that did a lot for me psychologically as an organizer of this conference, just knowing that we would have something real, a real healthy intellectual conversation, even if our tech collapsed. Um, rubric number two is that equipment matters. Um, you know, the, the microphone quality varied from site to site. Uh, I had the impression that all the universities with whom I was working had more available funding than we did, but it turned out our, our mics were, were in that, the, uh, tech room at the undergraduate library, they turned out to be better than uh, uh, Georgetown's mic, for example. So that was helpful to, to uh, see that. Good microphones seem to be crucial. I say this conscious that I'm using the microphone on my laptop, which is not a high quality mic. So forgive me, when the pandemic hit, like I don't have one of those nifty headsets that we saw uh, Verletta speaking on. Um, and rubric number three is sort of obvious, but a lot of people to whom I've talked about this say, well, of course, we'll still want to go to conferences. And of course, we'll still want to go to conferences, right? Our point is not, our point was never to replace real conferencing, or I mean, there I go, talking about Israel. Our, our point is not to replace in-person conferencing, right? Our point is only to, to think about digital possibilities and how we can supplement um, other things. So we're gonna do it again. We plan to do it again, even before we all start teaching in Zoom. Uh, for the pandemic. Uh, we've got an event planned for 2024 and uh, you'll notice that all of the places who did that previous conference signed up again. Uh, Emory's in Atlanta, Georgetown's in DC, Baylor's in Waco, and uh, we're in Seattle. So we're excited about this possibility um, and about what it can do. So okay, that's it. I'll stop now. Thank you so much, Charles. And it really was for me it was so eerie to be thinking about, you know, you all were thinking about digital possibilities, but without necessarily COVID being around just yet. Like that the, the impulse wasn't necessarily to do it because yeah. of a pandemic, it was for other reasons. So I find that it's almost eerie to hear you recount this without the pandemic being on the scene. Yeah. Um, so those glorious days. Those, yeah. Before, before the pandemic, before when the we could go shopping, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for all of you who are putting such interesting comments in the chat. We have some really interesting responses going on to the first presentation and the second presentation. Any questions that are occurring to people, put them in the Q&A. Um, questions that all of our panelists could be answer, could answer would be great, but also specific ones are great too. Um, next, we have Madeline Munt from the Research Commons and the Libraries. Yeah, thank you all so much. I feel like I've already learned so much from Charles and Christine. And to the comment about lighting, I'm laughing because I'm, I've actually already moved twice while waiting for my turn lighting right. So it's, it's hard. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about the Going Public Symposium at the UW Libraries. And 
want to acknowledge that Verletta and Elliot were both um, deeply involved in the planning of that symposium too. Verletta and I were co-chairs and Elliot was on the planning group. So I hope in the Q&A period, either of you will feel free to jump in and answer questions too. Um, going public is a public scholarship symposium that um, 2020 was supposed to be the third event. It was the third event. Um, the previous two events were held face-to-face -face in the Research Commons, which is a space within the UW libraries. Um, it's, you know, it's the space that um, I manage in my role at the libraries, and it's a, um, we do a lot of events celebrating student research and interdisciplinary research and public scholarship at UW. So um, we've had various themes um, throughout the years. This year's theme was opening scholarship to all, so it was an equity-focused theme. Um, and we started planning for this face-to-face -face event on March 26th, back in September. So long before COVID even began, we were planning for a face-to-face -face event. And we were planning for an event that would take um, the majority of a day. Um, we were going to have a keynote. Um, some short talks that would run parallel, so parallel sessions, attendees could choose which to go to. Um, we were planning for a box lunch for all attendees and parallel workshops over the course of lunch. And we were also planning for um, a coffee break in the morning and then a panel to wrap things up. Um, and we had a number of great people confirmed. We um, got Nikita Oliver as our keynote speaker, which we were super excited about, um, and some other great public scholars um, within and outside the UW. Um, then in early March, COVID hit. So, and, and really we were in the same boat as Christine and Wei, although our conference was a couple days earlier. Um, in early March, we made the decision to take the conference fully online. Actually, we made the decision the day before the UW canceled face-to-face -face classes for the rest of the quarter. Um, and then by the time the conference was supposed to be held on the 26th of March, Washington had just implemented the stay-at-home order. And when we were first making the call of whether to take it online, things were so up in the air, um, but kind of our, our biggest fear was that we would go ahead and continue planning for this thing and then have to cancel it just a couple days before. Um, and we certainly would have. We, I think we would have had to cancel it earlier, but certainly when the stay-at-home order came down, we would have canceled it. So when we decided to take it online, we had about three weeks of planning time. Um, and so what did we do? Um, we cut down the length considerably, um, although it was still, a five hour event start to finish. Um, we got rid of parallel sessions. So that meant that all attendees and all presenters were in the same Zoom space the whole day. We didn't have to worry about setting up multiple Zoom rooms or breakout rooms. Um, we cut the workshops, which we were really sad about. That made sense at the time people were most people were just starting to learn how to teach on Zoom, particularly how to do something like lead an interactive workshop. We felt like we couldn't ask people to put a workshop together in, in three weeks. And we also felt like, you know, I think that also attendees were not as comfortable attending a workshop on Zoom as they are today, two months later. So if we were holding this in June, I would still offer workshops, but we needed to make it shorter. And we were able to switch one workshop to a short talk, which was great. Um, we looked at our list of presenters then and confirmed with all the remaining presenters and panelists that they were interested in doing an online event. Almost everyone was. I think we just lost one presenter. Um, we at this point, and when I say we, I really mean Verletta. She was the genius behind this. We shuffled the budget around a lot because we had a bunch of funding that we'd been approved for. We had a, a bunch of funding for lunch. Lunch is expensive. Um, suddenly we don't have to serve lunch or do a coffee break. We also had funding for the keynote speaker, which didn't change. That still went to pay our keynote. Um, but we were able to work with our administration 
to rather than paying for lunch, um, get a license for Zoom webinar. And that allowed us to um, have more seats in the conference, allow more people to register. Um, it also gave us some privacy features that we felt better about at the time. I, I think that today people know a lot more about Zoom and a lot of those, some of those privacy features can kind of be recreated by um, messing with the settings in standard Zoom. But, you know, we were able to prevent people from, pretend, prevent attendees from sharing screen, um, video, audio, um, which at the time Zoom bombing was kind of just starting to become the hot topic everybody was worried about, so we were glad of that. And it also um, provides a bit more privacy for attendees in something that's being recorded or in a very large webinar. Um, we then um, did practice sessions in Zoom webinar with each presenter. Again, I'm not, you know, we didn't do that for this panel, which I also helped organize in addition to being a panelist. Um, people are more familiar with Zoom now, and I don't think it's necessary, but particularly for like a keynote speaker delivering an hour long talk who hasn't ever used Zoom webinar, um, we were really glad we did the test and we were able to test things like screen sharing and make sure people's mics were of good quality. So that was, that took a lot of time, but I'm glad we did it. Um, and then we also used some of the money we were originally budgeted to get live captioning. And that's something we've done today as well. And there are all different ways to approach captioning. And I, um, I appreciated Christine and Wei sharing the way they did it with getting videos captioned up on YouTube. Um, We've gotten live captioning through um, the Disability Resources Office at the UW. It's not free. We're definitely, we're paying for it. Um, I, I feel like it sort of replaces the money we might be spending on refreshments for a physical event, but I know that it's not possible to always do that. So, you know, I'm glad to hear about these other ways of making something more accessible. We thought that since our event, was specifically about um, about equity and access. Um, it was particularly important. And then today for this, since this is kind of about best practices and, and how to hold an online conference, we felt like it was good to model the captioning too. Um, so I am also running a little low on time, I realize. But on the day of, things went very smoothly, and I would attribute that to all the testing that we did. Um, people engaged in both the Q&A and the chat. We had no Zoom bombing. We did have um, one instance of inappropriate comments in the chat, and that led to one of our lessons learned, which is what I want to close with. Um, when Verletta and Elliot opened this session, they mentioned the library's code of conduct. Um, Having, we, we really, after having these inappropriate chat comments and not having a procedure or structure in place to deal with them, um, we realized the importance of just putting it out there to the audience that there are expectations. And, um, you know, on, in, that, in that event, if we had introduced the code of conduct in advance, one of us could have said to that person, you know, you're in violation of this part of the code of conduct that's about harassing people. You know, you need to stop or you'll be removed. So um, <clears throat> that was a lesson learned. We should have made it shorter and we should have had more breaks. Um, I think we've all learned that by now that it's hard to sit and stare at a screen for five hours. Um, I think we were afraid that if we gave too many breaks, people would leave and not come back. But you know, the attendees in the feedback all said, they would have liked more breaks. So um, what else? And then being able to share the recording and transcripts is really a plus. I saw somebody asking in the Q&A here, you know, about stats. And since our recordings are up on the library's YouTube channel, so um, we are able to see some stats. And I can see that the keynote has had 172 views. I just checked that. So. Um, 
But one thing that I think we lost out on was that interaction that you have in a face-to-face -face conference. And I'm really listening to what um, Christine, you guys said, and what Charles said about different ways to get that in. So I like the idea of having a, an informal Zoom room that's not webinar where people can interact. Um, I really like what you're saying, Charles, about hybrid conferences, because I hope that when this is all over, rather than just going back to the way things were, we take some of these lessons we've learned about what can be done online and, you know, put together conferences that really can bring together the best of all worlds and also be more sustainable. So I think that's, um, that's my time. That's all I have to share. Great. Thank you so much, Madeline. And thanks for the reminder too, that I think a lot of us have just learned a lot about Zoom in these past few months, or also Zoom has just changed a lot in these past few months. Um, so next we have uh, Matt Poland, who's going to speak with us about, we kind of went from pandemic times with Christine and Wei to before those times with Charles and then back to pandemic times with Madeline. And now with Matt, I think we're going back to before the pandemic. So we might see odd pictures of 10 people sitting together in a room again. Um, but Matt, please take it away. Thank you. Yeah, I'm kind of going to do both. Uh, uh, so let me uh, just very quickly share my screen here and I will um, follow Madeline in apologizing for my lighting since my uh, desk faces away from the window. I tend to look a little bit like God and that is not my intention, obviously. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, I have a couple of slides to share. Um, and the first thing that I was going to note is that if you um, want to follow along with uh, the slides or follow the links that I, that I provide in the slides, uh, I have my slides on my website, mattpoland.net. Go to presentations. I'm happy to talk about that. I think it's a good way to create new uh, ways to interact uh, uh, with by sharing slides. Um, so the kind of the main points that that I want to talk about today um, are first making online conference interactions more structured. Again, kind of like Charles's, uh, the, the ecology uh, conference, this, uh, the event that I'm going to talk about was partly online and partly in person. But we, in order to, you know, kind of have the best of both worlds, we, we thought a lot about ways to make um, those interactions via the internet more structured in order to make the exchange more generative. Um, and then I'm going to kind of close uh, by uh, echoing uh, some of the things that, that the other panelists have, have uh, invoked ideas of equity uh, and of accessibility by thinking about the, um, the, uh, the way that our organizing these new collectives uh, for the exchange of ideas can also be uh, parlayed into political action. Um, so uh, I'm going to start off with the first point about uh, making things more structured. Uh, I'm a literary scholar, so I think of things in terms of form, and I was struck in thinking about the form of the panel discussion, that it's actually surprisingly unstructured. That like the you know what we're doing right now has kind of five big chunks of time, uh, uh, one every ten minutes. Uh, a keynote lecture is way less structured than that, and may, and a seminar or a symposium maybe even less so. Like it's a, a seminar is supposed to be about the free exchange of ideas. It's supposed to be free flowing and improvisatory. And as others have said. Uh, here today, especially online, the relative lack of structure in forms uh, that, that are often parts of conferences uh, allows a lot of um, space for disengagement, right, as, as I think anyone who is teaching online uh, can attest to right now. And I think this should be extra um, troubling to us when we think about how the disengagement of marginalized communities, which we know is a problem in in-person settings like the classroom or, or uh, conferences could ramify uh, even further in online conferences. Um, so as a case study for thinking about how to redress this, I'm going to talk about um, the V21 Collective Summer um, Symposium reading groups that uh, I've helped organize here in Seattle for the last few years. As Elliot said, uh, uh, I'm not surprised he did his research. It's Victorian Studies for the 21st Century is, is what V21 stands for. And basically, it's an annual set of symposia where all the readings are the same. They're decided by the main organ 
organizers of the group, but the organization is done locally. Um, so there's a group in Chicago and in Austin and, uh, and uh, so on and so forth. So the, for the past few years, uh, the Pacific Northwest version has uh, been centered here at UW and in Seattle. But last year, uh, Megan Ward, who teaches English at Oregon State, and I wanted to widen the uh, in uh, um, the audience potentially to more people from around the region, since it is a uh, fairly far flung one. And then thinking about how to do that while uh, anchoring it online, we also wanted to find ways to redress this problem of potential disengagement. Basically what we wanted to do was figure out ways so that we wouldn't just have a talk uh, around a table in person and then get on Skype to the other table who had a talk and say, what did you guys talk about? Right, like we needed a little bit more um, than that. So we brainstormed uh, with Elliot, who actually was uh, integral in figuring out how to do this, uh, to come up with kind of a series of concrete tasks for each uh, for each set of seminars to do. One here in Portland, or uh, no, I'm sorry, <laughs> mix that up. One in Portland that Megan uh, was uh, was moderating and then one here in Seattle that I was moderating. And so we came up with some kind of tasks that were the same across the two groups to make the um, kind of discussions we had in person mutually intelligible. So I can show you this document and it will also be shared in my slides. This is just a description of the, uh, um, of the event and then the document itself is here. Sorry if it's a little bit small. So after we introduced uh, each, uh, each other on the, uh, uh, on the Skype call, we came up with what uh, questions, challenges, or prompts have the readings or topics brought up that you want help from the other group, the other seminar on the other side of the Skype call uh, to think about. And so basically kind of setting uh, some, uh, some topics and expectations up front that we then recorded uh, in a live Google Doc uh, so that it was completely transparent. Again, to kind of try to give it a little bit of structure. Uh, and then as you see, as we go through that document, um, we returned then to, uh, to the questions, the original questions that were posed by each group at certain intervals throughout the event and recorded how the, you know, kind of the directions that our conversation had taken so that the other group would have a sense for what was going on uh, on the other side since the Skype call uh, wasn't on the entire time. And then that, uh, that led to a final session uh, at the end of the event where we all came back together, both groups got back on Skype and kind of talked about uh, the points that had been raised on both sides uh, uh, of the conversation. Um, and we really found that uh, making the expectations for exchange clear overcame that, uh, that digital divide where we didn't, we didn't want to have just everyone on, bo on both sides on Skype the whole time, because that would feel a little bit awkward, but, uh, but neither, but we wanted to leverage what we could from uh, the online medium in order to kind of have our cake and eat it too, really, to, to be able to have the free flow of ideas that you get in a symposium, but also uh, benefit from the insights of people um, on the other side of, uh, of, of the call. Um, the V21 Collective's uh, kind of motto is make new collectives. And, uh, and I feel like these, uh, these techniques that, uh, that we came up with helped to make this a, a successful collective. Uh, just in kind of closing here with the last few minutes I have, um, everything that we've been talking about today has been geared towards creating productive collectives for the exchange of ideas online. And we're doing this because we can and because we should, we have the technology, um, but also because in some cases we're being forced to right, by the parlous environmental, economic, and epidemiological realities of being alive in 2020. Um, and I want to close by suggesting that our efforts to organize online and partly online conferences must be tied to interrogating why, in some cases, we're being forced to do so, and using our skills in creating collectives to organize them to make 
the world better. Um, as Charles said, uh, one of the main reasons to uh, that that uh, that academic conferences have turned to uh, the online medium is to reduce carbon footprint, and uh, I'm all for that. Like clearly, uh, if any if the pandemic has illustrated anything, it's the need for individual responsibility. Um, but I did some kind of back of the envelope math to think about the idea of the only way we as scholars can affect climate change is not by not traveling. So if everyone who went to a conference that I'm, that, that I'm going to go to in 2021 flew the same route that I will across the country to Philadelphia, um, we would still generate less than one hundredth of a percent of the greenhouse gases that the US military industrial complex does in an average week. So again, it's not that I'm not saying that we shouldn't be individually responsible or even responsible on the smallish collective level of like Victorian studies scholars, but uh, it's a false dichotomy to ask whether we travel or not because it implies that the only way we can affect climate change is by individual decisions. And so I think that what we should change to instead is thinking about can we travel more thoughtfully and also have a bigger impact by thinking how to make structural change through the communities that we're already organizing. I think that organizing intellectual exchange through conferences and political action need to be two sides of the same coin and really the tools and habits of mind we use uh, uh, for one uh, fertilize the other uh, in a lot of important ways. Um, I bring this up partly uh, to make space, especially right now, to think and talk about what we lose by not being together in person, kind of echoing what Madeline said earlier, conferences are bodily uh, experiences as well as intellectual ones. They're, they're about hugging old friends as much as going to talks, right? Here's me at a conference with one of my old friends, uh, <laughs> UW alumna Anna Wager. Um, so in planning online conferences, we have to think about that aspect and also about those kind of serendipitous networking opportunities that can't be formalized uh, and are, do not easily translate online. I have a lot of lines on my CV that came from, you know, uh, wandering up to someone during the wine hour uh, and losing those risks reinforcing structural and qualities, especially for graduate students and contingent faculty, as well as members of underrepresented communities. So in closing, I just want to say that we can and should uh, be making our conference practices more technologically ingenious, less centralized, and more accessible, as, as we all are. But, but I think we also have to be mindful about what might be lost and why it might be lost in order to remember that organizing new collectives for exchanging ideas can also have direct political utility. Thanks. Well, thank you so much, Matt, and thank you, Christine and Wei, and Charles and Madeline, and also a big thank you to Kelly, our captioner um, today. This was just a really fantastic um, series of presentations. So I'm going to put in the chat right now clapping. So I am virtually clapping for you. Thank you so much. And if anyone else wants to do some virtual clapping for our presenters, please feel free to do that. Um, if you have any questions for our presenters, please um, put them in our Q&A. Um, in here in, in Zoom. Um, the first question that came in um, is uh, someone has written, I'd like to know what kind of pushback organizers have gotten. Did you have to advocate to make these events happen online versus cancel or postpone them? So I think this is a question that is good, not just for during the pandemic, but even before the pandemic happened, was there pushback to do this? And I think Matt, in your closing, I think, you brought up another way that I, I'd be interested to hear you all talk about this is, I think pushback can come from others, but maybe in what ways are you critical of, or do you push back some of these concepts or qualms that you have with these online ways of doing conferences and seminars and events? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of start off um, just by saying, I think that one of, one of the things in thinking about these ideas of, of equity and of accessibility that, that several of us have, have brought up, I think that one of the important things is that uh, 
is that thinking about how to move things online gives us a sense of how to do, um, you know, kind of uh, in real life conferences better, right? Like it gives us a new way of thinking about it. And I think that, um, you know, I, I think that it gives us the opportunity to think about how, you know, for example, thing opportunities might be unequal right at at in-person conferences like do i as a uh you know white uh cis man have uh more indifferent opportunities than a young queer woman of color at a victorian studies conference and how can we you know kind of make the playing field level both in person and online uh and i think i think I, I don't have a great answer i love the idea of kind of informal zoom rooms uh, i think that's a great uh, great starting place but i think you know the important thing is that moving to a different modality gives us a chance to ask bigger questions about both uh both modalities right mm -hmm. I'll, I'll jump in and follow that up i um my short answer is is no, we did not get pushed back, at least as I can remember from the blur that was early March. I think maybe we got pushed back for a couple hours and then a couple hours later, it was clear that, that this was going to be a necessity if we wanted to keep the conference. But I think that that's sort of a function of the weird moment we were in. I could see us having gotten pushed back perhaps for wanting to offer an all online conference um, without the, those external factors. So, I mean, Christine, I'm really curious about your experiences being at the same moment that we were at and then Charles, you too. Sure, I mean, I, I would say that uh, to be honest and transparent here, the initial pushback may have come from me <laughs> to try to host and transition something in person to online. Although I think after some careful planning and looking to see what sort of support we have internally to do it, we just made the jump. Um, and two, it was a date that was already identified and something that was very much out there since it is a tri-campus event. Uh, any pushback was very minimal and it wasn't really pushback, so to speak, it was more of um, have you and your have you and the CTL considered hosting it at a later time? Um, and I think you know for many of our participants, they are instructors, and so they are at the same time we're trying to move their course online. And of the fifty five who were a part of it this year, um, I, I would say that for the most part, it was it was positive in terms of they were still able to showcase the investment of the work that was already there even prior to the pandemic. So if we were moving in person, they would have already been planning it anyway in terms of what they were going to do poster-wise. But moving it online, we just added the extra component of there is now a video presentation involved. Yeah, I would say the short answer to whether we got any institutional pushback is no. Uh, and part of the reason we got no pushback is that the very format was so cheap. Like we weren't flying anyone out from anywhere. So uh, to the contrary, like the Simpson Center for the Humanities, when I sent in my budget, they wrote back, we're gonna give you a little more money <laughs> just in case something comes up, right? I mean, because it was, it was uh, for the sort of quality of the event, the uh, caliber of scholars, who were participating, it was ridiculously inexpensive. Mm -hmm. um, the only pushback I've gotten at all is the kind that Matt just gave me uh, by people who say, when I say, well, I like the idea of online conferences because personally I'm troubled by my own carbon footprint and I, I find it uh, existentially uh, challenging to be constantly flying for academic reasons. Uh, and lots of people point out, as Matt so rightly does, that it's, you're worried about like spitting in the ocean and making it grow. Like your, your contribution is so tiny 
uh, that it's as to be negligible, and that's true for your whole conference too. Um, of course, that's true. I'm not saying that uh, I'm not saying don't fly, or or you can you can not fly and still write your congresswoman, right? <laughs> and you should, right? So so it's it's not a, it's not an either or thing. Um, but it's it's we're in a we're in a like I think climate change is a real thing. I mean. Yeah. And to to um, follow on what, what you were saying, Charles, I, I really liked the way that you that you framed it as as it clearly not the goal is not to replace in person conferences, but to build more sustainable supplements and to kind of have um, have a way to uh, um, to get the best of both worlds. I think I realized I didn't really answer the pushback question. I think like Christine, the pushback came from the organizers of like Megan and I putting our heads together saying, how are we going to widen this? How are we going to make this more accessible without totally, you know, disengaging and, and making it actually two events posing mm -hmm. as one. And I think that that's where the kind of ingenuity of, uh, of, of figuring out both kind of lesson plans, really, which is, which is what uh, um, Elliot and, and Megan and I came up mm -hmm. with, along with the, uh, the technological aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think I, I'm reflecting on this now. I think we did get a bit of not pushback, but we definitely had to justify all of those sudden changes that we wanted to make to our budget. Um, so that was, you know, that was to be expected, I think. And then just as Matt and Charles have been talking about kind of ethical issues around all of this and sustainability and individual responsibility, just something that hasn't come up yet that I've been thinking about. Um, I've read a decent amount of stuff from disability rights activists and just folks talking about um, in some ways how much more accessible an online event um, or an event with a transcript or a recording can be. So that's, you know, along with um, issues of environmental sustainability, that's something that I have learned to think more about through this pandemic and something I wanna keep in mind as we go back to offering face-to-face -face or hybrid events. Yeah, definitely. I didn't, I didn't bring the, uh, the list, but when I said that there were 19 nations, people in 19 nations who attended our conference, who logged on for our conference, I mean, there were people in far-flung places uh, who, who were, could not possibly have been to the conference site. So there's accessibility that way too. I mean, and and that's great. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, it it creates other problems. It's it's not a substitute for interpersonal, in real life, um, communications. But it does other things. It offers significant other things. Well, thank you so much, panelists, for excellent presentations, excellent discussion, um, and thank you to Kelly for captioning this and thank you to our fantastic attendees for all of your support and interesting connections that you've been making in the chat and this is hacking the academy we really um in libraries this is a series that we've been working on these past few years and we want to continue off continue offering things like this that really highlight the ingenuity creativity and criticality that so many incredible people at the UW are thinking about and doing in their work. So thank you so much for attending. And um, Verletta has put a feedback form in the chat too. So if you'd like to give us some feedback on Hacking the Academy and ways that we can improve it or new offerings we can make in the future, please check that out as well. So thank you so, so much. Nice, thank you.